we have a dilemma in our house. The dilemma is very simple. And that is we have a neighbor across the street whose name is Taylor. Now you can imagine what that does for the post office. But to compound it, make it worse, her first name is Margie. My mother's name was Margie. When we were settling the estates of parents, a lot of times we would get mail that was addressed to them at our address. And so it was not unusual to get a letter addressed to Margie Taylor, and I would just open it. One day I went to the mailbox, and I got the letter out, and it was addressed to Margie Taylor. I didn't think much about it. And so I came in the house, opened the envelope, started reading, and what I realized was I had gotten our neighbor's mail by mistake. I was reading someone else's letter, and I shouldn't admit. That's kind of the dilemma we have with the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. It is a strange book full of images and, and uh, beasts and all kinds of things that we don't understand. It become a, a playpen for all kinds of aberrant theories. But at its core are seven letters to seven churches. And the truth is that while it was delivered to them, they're reading our mail. Because those letters, while they were theirs, they are also ours. So over the next several weeks, we're going to visit churches and read letters that were destined to us, but got intercepted by them first. And through them, we're going to discover what God wants of us in changing times. Well, what about this book, Revelation, this one that we are so afraid of and we're so scared of? What, uh, what should we make out of it? Perhaps a little context will help. First of all, the background of the book of Revelation are changing times. It was the end of the first century. And a lot of changes were taking place. In 1964, a folk singer named Bob Dylan wrote a song on the cusp of great social upheaval of the 1960s. The name of the song, The Times, These Are a Changing. That could be the anthem of the end of the first century. The times were changing. One of the big changes, for the church at least, were that those who had known Jesus, the eyewitnesses, were dying. All of those men, those 12 men who had been called out of tax collectors' offices or out of fishing boats on Galilee, they were all gone, except for one. And that was John, and he was approaching his own century mark. They were losing the sense of eyewitness. There's something different when someone says, I saw this, rather than others say, I know someone who saw this. It does change, it seems. Luke Comter has an interesting distinction. He's 99 years old. He is the last remaining survivor of the USS Arizona. At 8 o'clock on December 7, 1941, the Japanese dropped bombs on the Arizona. It exploded and it sunk. When it sank in the harbor at Honolulu, it became a memorial to so many men, over 1,200 who had died in its hull. On board that ship that day was Lou Conter. He had to be fished out of the water, one of the survivors of the bombing. Conter can tell the story, I was there. I saw it. I know what happened. Can you imagine what happens when he dies? There will no longer be anyone to tell the story firsthand. They didn't see it. Wonder how the story will change when the eyewitness is gone. That's really the struggle that, that everyone has. You see, in, in Revelation, no longer are those men there who are the voices that have said, I saw the sea calmed. I heard the voice when it said, it is finished on the cross. I gazed into the empty tomb. I looked into heaven and saw him go back into heaven. I was there. Now, History will replace eyewitness. The question is, will the story change? And so here we are, thinking about these men who have gone, which leaves a second change. That second change is very simple, and that is it's connected to the first one. The first generation is passing. The second generation is now taking over. All those churches, like Ephesus, that have been founded by Paul and served by Timothy, all of those people who knew those men, who were there at the founding, 
who were part of the beginning. They're dying. We see the members of those churches at that time were now attending the funeral of the founders. It is said in a relay race, the worst time of the race is when one runner hands the baton to another. It's there that if the baton is dropped, the race is lost. This was baton passing time. And the question would be, will the next generation treat it the way the first generation did? Will they respect what has been done? Or will they change it? You see, there's always this, this pressure when generational changes come. For the new generation says, well, that's what our fathers did. Do we have to do that? I don't think so. And therefore, things change. That was what they were experiencing at the end of the first century. But that came up in the context of the reincarnation of great suffering and persecution. Nero had started his wholesale persecution of the church in 64 AD and then had waned. But now it looked like Nero had come back to life in the form of a Roman emperor named Domitian. Domitian was ruthless. He declared himself God, and anyone who did not worship him was considered an atheist. He would destroy anything and anyone who did not bow. That included his own family. He had a cousin named Flavius Clemens who is the Romans historian said she was executed because she had become an atheist. Eusebius the, Eusebius, the church historian, wrote a different picture of it. He said she was executed because she became a Christian. Same thing to Domitian. It was a terrible time that created all kinds of pain and suffering for the church, and it would last for another 200 years from emperor to emperor. And a lot of things happened during that time. I remember I had a church history professor who characterized the times of Domitian as the time when there were the cracking of bones and spurting of blood. It was an apt description. And churches had to think in terms of what can I do to maintain the faith but still stay, stay safe? That creates an internal pressure on people that they begin to shift some things to stay safe. And one of the big issues of the time was Suppose someone succumbs and they deny Christ. When the persecution is over, do you welcome them back by them saying, I was just trying to stay alive? It's an interesting question that has no good answer. But even on top of that change, it brought something else. And that was the culture began to pollute the church. When you're surrounded by something, it's only natural that certain things begin to soak in. After all, if persecution is saying you're not going to be safe if you don't confess that Caesar is Lord, maybe there's some other things. Do you accept all those changes like the idolatry and the weird teachings that's beginning to take place in the church? Do you repel them? If you don't oppose, which is too dangerous, and it's, it's too unpleasant to adopt them, there's only one middle ground. And that's accommodation. And these churches were beginning to struggle with the concept of accommodation. Why don't we just tolerate it? We don't have to believe it. We don't have to accept it for ourselves, but we can accommodate it. And so all the pollution of the culture began to flow into the church. And while some will say accommodation of the times is what we need to do, understand something. Tolerance over time becomes acceptance, which becomes the faith. It always happens. The siren song of adaptation was pulling the church away. All churches are caught in the crisis of change. We all go through changing times. The times have changed lately, haven't they? A lot of things are different 10 weeks later. That's a short time, but massive change. The question for all churches is, what do you do with the change that you feel? That is, is it a pressure? Do you, do you try to adapt to it, adopt it? Do you repel it? It's a difficult situation. 
but it's one that all of us face. Every church, every time, wherever we are, we all face that problem. Because we face that problem, these letters tell us more about who we are than anything else we can read. But what about this book? This strange little book called Revelation. It's been said that if you're studying through the Bible and you get to the book of Jude, you need to stop and turn around because you're headed for danger. That's Revelation. And nobody knows what Revelation's about. After all, it's a strange book. It's filled with beasts and and horns and uh, horsemen and glass and chains and bottomless pits. It's not like anything we're aware of. It's not like anything that is in our experience. It's not letter. It's not biography. It's not poetry. It's a whole different form that comes out of the times of tribulation called Apocalypse. Listen to the first verse of the book of Revelation. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to the servant John. And that one fast sweeping view of the entire book, the very first word, Revelation, is the word Apocalypse. Apocalypse is a kind of material, a kind of literature, if you will, that means to be revealed. Something that is hidden has been revealed. And it's full of codes. If you wanted to communicate a message to someone, but if you were in danger of that message falling into the wrong hands and it might convict you, you'd write it in code. And that's what this book is. It is a letter from Jesus, written through John, to people, but it's written in code. And the people who received it originally are the best ones to understand it because they were living through the situations. Now, today, it has gotten complicated because people have all kinds of aberrant theories that come out of Revelation, really strange things. And yet, the people there at the end of the first century Living through the times they were there, they understood this book better than we do. We struggle to understand. They read and go, ah, I understand it. I got it. In fact, apocalyptic was not unusual in terms of form. Plutarch, the ancient biographer, wrote about Pythagoras. Pythagoras one time, he upbraided a student in, in front of other people. The student was so despondent, so dejected, he went out and he hanged himself. Plutarch said that from that time on, Pythagoras never admonished anyone when anyone else was present. For he said, for error should be treated as a foul disease, and all admonition and disclosure should be kept in secret. That term disclosure is the same word for revelation. In other words, you make the revelations in secret. That's apocalyptic. That's what revelation is. It's a secret message to the people who are designed to understand it. It's what makes it so strange for us, so difficult for us. We come and we go, I don't understand this thing called revelation. It doesn't make any sense to us. And yet, it made perfect sense to them. But who writes it? And we've always said that John the Apostle writes the book of Revelation. Look at a Bible handbook. It'll tell you that. As author, John is the author. But that's not exactly true. If you read what it says, beginning, say, in verse 9, it says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that is ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. John is exiled, that we'll get to in just a moment. But as he's there, he's there by himself. He is thinking of the church, even though he, he is together with the church, but apart from the church. Does that sound like a familiar scenario? He says, I was in the spirit in the Lord's day, and suddenly I heard this voice, and it sounded like a trumpet. It was piercing the silence of the island. He turned around, and the voice identifies itself. It says in verse 18, I am the living one. 
I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death in Hades. John had heard the voice before. It was the voice of someone he had not heard in two-thirds of a century. Someone he would knew quite well was the voice of Jesus. But while the human voice of Jesus had spoken to him as a young man, the divine voice of Jesus spoke to him as an old man. And he is given a task. And the role, what this means is that really the author of the book of Revelation is Jesus himself. The images, the visions, the words, they all come from Jesus himself. They're not John's. These were not made up by a man. These, these are the divine visions of Jesus. It's an amazing thing to think of. Now, what role does John play? Well, John is, uh, the best we could say, it, he's probably just the messenger, a secretary. He's living on the island of Patmos, being exiled by the Domitian Empire. With the strategy is if we separate the Christians from their leadership, the Christians will die. It's a smart strategy. It just didn't work. He is exiled on this little island called Patmos, which is off the coast of Turkey. It's out in the Mediterranean, and it is a good place to exile someone. It's a rocky little, little island surrounded by nothing more than blue water. To the west is the Mediterranean. And the next stopping off point is a long, long way. It has been described as either the ancient Alcatraz or the place where the end of the world began. I like the second one because it says so much, not just about the island, but about the book. And here is this book written by John on this ancient island away from all people. What's he supposed to do? He can't go anywhere. He can't speak to anyone. He's by himself. But then Jesus continues in verse 19. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. John is his secretary. He writes the things on a scroll. He takes a pen, begins to dip it in ink, and writes the things he sees, the beasts, the images, the chains, the bottomless pits. He writes letters to seven churches. He is the transmitter of the truth, not the originator of the truth. This is what God wants us to know. This is what Jesus' will is. And so he tells John, write these things down. And so this is a book that is spoken by Jesus to a secretary named John for our benefit. And John writes this specifically, it says, to the seven churches of Asia. When you get a look at verse 11, it says, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These seven churches all form a ring on the mainland of Turkey. They are all part of a circuit, it appears, that John knew quite well. John's hometown, John's point of uh, his target was uh, Ephesus. That's where he lived in his last part of his life. That was his home church. Eusebius tells us an interesting story about uh, John as he's an old man. He's gotten feeble. He can't walk as well. He can't hear as well. He's like any 90-year-old. He's slowed down some. But every Sunday, they would help him to a chair in front of the congregation. And they'd ask him the question, John, do you have anything to say to us today? And John would always say the same thing. Dear children, love one another. Here was John, the John, the apostle of love, thinking about these seven churches, so close and yet so far. He's concerned about them. He knew times were changing. He knew the pressures upon them. He knew that they were, they were rife for the plucking of the devil. He wanted to tell them what needed to be done. He wanted them to hear the voice of Jesus. And so these seven churches are his recipient. But are they? The word seven, the number seven, is used 54 times in the book of Revelation. 
It's a very symbolic number. I mean, it doesn't take much to think about what the symbolism means. Genesis tells us that in six days, God created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested. A full week, a complete week, seven days. We know that. It's lasted since the beginning. The best interpretation of word seven is this is not just for just the seven churches of Asia, although it is, but it's a broader concept. It is for the whole church. Every church in every age, in every place, is the recipient of these letters. Now, while Pergamum or Sardis or Thyatira might read the letters, we are given the opportunity to eavesdrop on them and to hear ourselves being talked about in certain ways. Is it a good kind of talk or are we being demeaned? See, if those are the letters written to them, but they apply to us, understand they're not history. It's really hard for us in the 21st century to think about things like this, that things 2,000 years ago apply to us today. After all, a lot of people feel like the Bible is nothing more than a, an old book written in an old time to old people who are gone. It's easy to slide into that. We get on a computer and go to a Zoom meeting. They unrolled a scroll and read, handwritten lettering. The truth is the letters that are written to these seven churches are the letters that are written to each one of us as well. To tell us what we need to do tells who we are and what we need to think about. They're evaluating us. So it's not just those seven churches. It's the church of all places, in all times, all cultures, all languages. There's something we share together. But the burning issue of the book of Revelation is very simple. In these changing times, can the bride of Christ remain pure? Years ago, I heard one of the best sermons I've ever encountered. It was preached by a, a man named Glenn Owen. Now, Glenn was a, a, a fabulous human being, a great Christian. He had been a, one of the original missionaries on the team to Sao Paulo, Brazil. He was fluent in three languages, Portuguese, Spanish, and English, and could move comfortably between them. And when he was in Brazil, he, he related an experience that had happened that he knew of. There was going to be a wedding, but the day of the wedding, the parents of the bride discovered she had not been chased. She had not been faithful. So they refused to let her wear a white dress. Instead, she walked the aisle in a black dress because she was not pure. The question of the sermon was, can the bride wear white or black? That's the question of, of Revelation. Does the bride wear black? It's testing the values that Jesus holds dear. Jesus believed in things and he says, I want to know what the rhythm of the churches are. Are they righteous or rebellious? Are they faithful or are they failing? It's those values. It's those bedrock principles of Christianity that are being exposed in this book. In the worst possible way, when people are being threatened, you find out what they really believe. So it is that there are really two things that Jesus is doing with these churches. First, he's taking their temperature. And we've gotten used to that in the last 10 weeks. We've gotten used to the picture of someone holding what looks like a gun, pointing it at the forehead of someone with a little green or red dot on it, and with a readout that gives the temperature. They're find, trying to find out if you're sick or not. Jesus takes the temperature of the churches. What's the state of their health? Where are they sick? What is the virus that has invaded them? What's crippling them and what may kill them? See, Jesus takes the temperature of churches all the time because he says, I know what I know. I know what health is. 
Are you healthy? Are we healthy? Are we, A, number one, okay, ready to go? Or is there something hiding in us that is causing sickness? Jesus measures the temperature. The second thing he does, he hangs a plumb line in churches. Now, unless you work in masonry, plumb lines are old things. They're they're things that we don't know of. But a, a brick mason, for instance, if he wants to make sure a wall is straight, he'll take a string and he'll hang a heavy object at the bottom, usually called a bob. And he puts it against the wall. And when the string straightens from the weight, he'll know whether the wall leans left or right. It's called a plumb line. And if it is not straight, it is out of plumb. Jesus hanged plumb line in churches. He wants to see if you lean left or right or you're straight with his will. And through this book, through these seven churches, these seven letters, he's going to hang that plumb line and say, here's what straight looks like and here's what is off. Do we have that? Because Jesus still has that plumb line in his hand in every church and every time, measuring his faithfulness. So over the next few weeks, we're going to take a visit to churches. When I was in college, I had a class, and I, one of the professors I had was, well, the nice way to put it, it was he was eccentric. And uh, I remember one day he came into class, and he's flailing his arms. He said, I've got a great idea. We're going to go visiting churches tomorrow. And I thought to myself, anything to get me out of this class for a day, I'll take. The next day, we packed up in cars, and we ran to, through six different churches in Abilene, Texas. I've got to tell you, of all the days I spent in that class, that's the only one that I learned anything valuable in. And I've used it the last 45 years because there's something that happens when you go into churches. You get to see what they believe in. You get to see how they act. You get to see their principles. You get to see their values. And so we're going to visit churches, seven churches. We're going to sit in the pews. We're going to watch their worship. We're going to see who they associate with, who they congregate with. We're going to look at all the things that Jesus looks at in every church, including ours. And in that visit, we can see a lot of things. But there are three things we need to remember as we make these visits to these seven churches. The first is Christ is at the center. Jesus is walking through the churches. He's sitting in the pews. Not as a visitor, but as the founder. And he wants to know, are you building this church the way I want to build? How are you treating what I paid with life and blood for? And no matter what we would like to think, we are not the center of the church. The wishes and desires of men are not the center of the church. Jesus is the center of the church. And we either remain with him we depart from him in some ways. Jesus is the center. The second is the message is for now, not just then. Again, we have the problem of history. If it's just historical, we can always say, what was it like? But if it's testimony, it's what is it like? For the truth of Jesus is not what was true. The truth of Jesus is what is true. I know it's a subtle distinction, but it's a real distinction. And to call Bible history is a misnomer. Bible is not history. It's proclamation. And that proclamation is as real today in the 21st century as it was in 96 AD when churches were struggling under the whip hand of Domitian. Listen to the message because it applies to us today, not just to them back then. But the third thing is that the will of God never changes, even though times change. We're all caught by changing times. We change a lot in 10 weeks. I can tell you, I would never believe that I would be sitting up in my kitchen teaching a Bible class to a dumb machine called a computer, hoping somebody would watch. But guess what? We're here. But the will of God is not like technology. It's not something that changes and we adapt to. The will of God remains the same all the time. 
When God spoke the church into existence, he spoke into the existence and said, this is what I want it to be. This is what I want it to look like. This is how I want it to worship. He broaches no departure. And the temptation for humankind is to say, yes, but I like it, or I think, or we have talked about this, and we have come to a conclusion. And with that, Jesus laughs. The will of God is not up to vote. It's not up to discussion. It's only up for obedience. And there are times in life that what we're going to have to do will displease those around us, but they will please God. There's a man whose name was Nezvestny. He was a sculptor in the old Soviet Union. He was the best sculptor, in fact, one of the finest. He had designed the monument that is on Nikita Khrushchev's grave. When it came time, to uh, have the Communist Party headquarters built. They wanted Nezvesky to do it. They said, only he can design what we need, but we need a communist Nezvesny because he had Christian leanings. And so they were suspicious. Nezvesny built the sculpture in pieces and with every piece, he got approval for that piece. But it wasn't until the opening of the building and the unveiling of the statue that they saw the hole and they gasped in horror. There, on the Soviet Union's prized headquarters, Nezvesny had sculpted a cross. They asked him, and he said, cross, don't you see a face? But they all knew. They could all see the cross. And with that, he was exiled to Switzerland, never to return. But the cross remained. Let it be the heritage that we have, that when all is said and done, we have felt our own exile in our own land, that they say, but the cross remained. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next week.